Hello everyone. Um, most of you I've seen already on the corridors and um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you so, so much for your interest also in listening to some research stories or research examples from South Africa. Um, yes, I will be talking a little bit about snippets of a project that I've been um, involved in on sustainable diets and food systems. Um, just to briefly sum up what Stephanie already started is that in 2004 was the first time I went to South Africa, then as a master's student, um, and a student of the Jena University in Germany. Then um, in the same project, I carried on my PhD study, then going to Gießen University in Germany. Um, after 2010, the photograph you see here are my promoters of my PhD study. Ha, clicking. <laughs> promoters of my PhD study. Um, Stephanie saw the picture and said, wow, I look, so, I look so young here. I think she still looks the same. Um, it was the, the defense of the study. That's what, how we do it in Germany. And um, I finally received the degree on that day in 2010. Um, in between working for FAO and then returning to South Africa to the Northwest University, first as a postdoctoral researcher and then um, becoming a permanent staff member of um, of the Northwest University, and um, not just because Northwest University is so amazing and there are a lot of research projects or research interests that I'm um, fulfilling, but also because in between career life happens, I met already as master students my now husband, and that's the main reason why I settled in South Africa. Um, so Northwest University, uh, I'm coming from the Africa Unit of Transdisciplinary Health Research, it's quite a bulky name and short we say author, um, and we are trying to do research in an effort to offer realistic solutions to real life health and well-being challenges. So it's very broad and very complex, but we are, we are having three main focus areas. One is on health promotion well-being, one on sustainable community development, community engagement, and one on the sustainable diets and food systems arena. Of course, very often we are collaborating and linking with each other, but I'm more the focal point for the sustainable diets and food systems research in my research unit. Um, Shortly, uh, not everyone may be familiar with the term of sustainable diets, even though it's quite old, it already comes from the 80s, where nutritionists started to talk about diets not just in terms of health, but also in terms of sustainability issues, such as planet, profit, people. I've highlighted it here, so it's not just a diet that needs to be healthful, but also a diet that needs to consider natural resources, economic benefits, and also strengthen and not weaken communities. So it's quite an old concept, but somehow it was forgotten in the meanwhile. And in 2012, FAO and biodiversity took it up again, and it became quite a mainstream topic among nutritionists. And the moment it came out, it um, very quickly went to um, the idea of that sustainable diets cannot, one cannot destroy sustainable diets without considering the food system as an integrated integrated part of um, achieving sustainable diets. Um, I've put up the HLF on the high level panel expert report of 2017 here. I heard that your director, Michel Pumbert, um, has also been part of the panel and of this report. Um, so this puts very much in place the role of food systems in the overall um, achieving or good or healthy nutrition and food security, very interesting. Um, I've taken out the definition of food systems, although most of you are probably aware of it out of this report here. So a food system gathers all elements, and meaning elements such as environment, people, inputs, process, infrastructure, institutions, but also all activities, including production, processing, distribution, preparation, consumption of food, but also with the overall aim or the output of these activities that should include socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. Um, the, the report also has the different pathways of um, or the links between food system and nutrition. It's quite complex. 
You can see here that the ultimate outcomes should be nutrition and health outcomes, as well as impacts on social, economic, and environmental issues. We've got our top drivers, and of course, we've, we acknowledge the role of political program and institutional activities, and we can place it in almost all sustainable development goals, and also the food security dimensions of ex availability, access, utilization are in there. But really, in the heart, I feel, and some may disagree, um, I feel that the issue of um, food supply chain, food environment, and consumer behavior are uh, um, the issues that impact the consumer's capacities to adopt a sustainable diet. And um, this is a bit where my research focus um, lies on, and also what my main interest is. It's basically in these three components, often food environments seen as this middle part where the demand and the supply meet. Um, yes, and that's that's more the yeah, perspective where I come from. If we move to South Africa, I mean there's a lot to talk about South Africa, but I have to make it short for today. And uh, looking into South Africa's food security and nutrition challenges. Um, still based, or still based, yeah, on the um, apartheid system, we do have um, still mainly large-scale commercial farmers in South Africa who produce the majority of market outputs. As such, we are in national statistics said to be um, food secure, but our um, household surveys within South Africa show that we do have a high degree of household food insecurity in terms of people experiencing hunger or being at risk of being hunger. At the same time, very worrying for our public health system is that we have um, rapidly rising obesity levels um, with every third woman and every fourth man at this point being either overweight or obese in South Africa. And we still have high inequality resulting in a lot of uh, in a high, yeah, in a high percentage of people living in poverty, and these also in, um, or especially in rural areas. Coming back to my, my the sustainable diets, food systems, where I come from, seeing these statistics, uh, my research question was really, what are the challenges and opportunities for sustainable diets, in especially in rural resource poor communities? And um, when we talk about rule, a lot of research I've done in one specific area of South Africa, which is called the Falhaz area. Just for your orientation, we've got Johannesburg there. This is where my university lies in Kochestrum. And Falhaz is still about 300 kilometers away from Poch. It may not even be about 450 to 500 kilometers from um, Johannesburg. And why is Falhaz so interesting? Because Farhas is among the biggest, if not the biggest, um, irrigation schemes in the southern hemisphere. And um, this is a little Google view of Farhas. It's called Farhas because it's embraced by the Val and the Harz River. The Harz River in, in the north um, going down into the arm of the Val River um, further down in the south. And we really see nicely here these, um, these, oh, these, um, chessboard kind of um, canals going down where the irrigation flows down and of course the, the um, green agricultural area. So it's about the size of almost 40,000 hectares of irrigation scheme, really large. It was implemented during apartheid times in uh, 1934 for poverty elevation for the white um, population in South Africa. Today, we've got about 1,000 farmers, of which still 47% are established commercial farmers, often large-scale farms, um, and often uh, owned since generations, while we also have now about 53% of emerging farmers, meaning after the apartheid system, large, rather large-scale plots were allocated to um, emerging, previously disadvantaged farmers. Um, Agriculture as such contributes in this area to about 10% of the local economy and contributes to 11% um, of the local employment. And I really, I, I'm, I was so intrigued by this research, uh, by this area, because it's, it's literally like a food basket in South Africa with lots of different crops being produced. 
but within the farm areas, we have really impoverished communities with high unemployment um, and um, lots of social problems as well. <clears throat> this is, um, yes, so I'm, I'm talking a little bit today about, it, it's actually a couple of research projects that came together starting from 2013 up to 2017 and um, coming back to sustainable diets. Um, the main idea was looking into sustainable diets in farmhouse, but from different angles, from different dimensions. And as you can see here, um, there are those six dimensions I was looking into. The first one is come, being a nutritionist, of course, looking into food security and nutrition issues, um, including household food security, um, nutritional status, dietary diversity. Then we looked into local food structures, we looked into production practices, for instance, or supply chains. We also started looking into environmental issues, such as food consumption footprints, um, land and water use, for instance, or crop diversity. We had um, at the bottom the economic efficiency uh, looked upon in terms of food affordability, um, local food supply. And we also looked into sociocultural issues in terms of consumer choices, but also traditional knowledge, intergenerational relations, and um, last, we also looked into the governance and policy framework matters, um, all within the case study of Fahlhaus. And as you can imagine, it was not a project done just by myself. I had a lot of collaborators um, within the Northwest University where I'm coming from, um, from different fields such as agricultural economics, environmentalists, sociologists, who all brought bits and pieces into this project. Um, I also collaborated a lot with Stephanie, one of the reasons I'm here today. So together with Coventry University and University of Hohenheim and also from colleagues from the Justus Liebig University in Germany. We received um, different funding streams because different little project pieces came together. And I would like to, that's why I said it would be snippets um, in, in the time I have today, just to touch on some of the dimensions and tell you a little bit what we found in the area. This is the first one talking about food security and nutrition, so the overall situation. Um, here I'm referring to 80 households by the time we had well, 79 households. We are now having actually 120 households. We need to update the slides, but the picture is very much similar. We have high unemployment, only almost 60%, as well as almost 40% dependency on social grants, meaning either child grants or pension grants. Um, if we look in homestead garden production, often people think we are in an agricultural area here, but we see that only one quarter of households more or less has a little garden. And livestock rearing is, um, is, yeah, is done by about one third of households, but mainly um, referring to chicken or then uh, goats uh, and sheep. And if we look into the household and household food security status, it's kind of based on experiences. We asked you, do um, you have worries about food? Um, are you worried about your children? sometimes go out of food uh, for an evening or skip meals and so forth. And we really found that over 60% of households are categorized as severely food insecure. But as I mentioned already, um, like in the overall picture of South Africa, we really have this double burden of malnutrition, meaning that on one side um, we have food insecurity, but on the other side, as you can see here, um, while the men still at the normal weight range, most of the men, we really do see that women are affected by overweight and obesity. Um, if we look into what is eaten um, dietary diversity, so what is eaten um, during the day, we are, we are talking about food groups here, we can see that most of the households report, it's almost 100%, that starchy staples are eaten every day, which is mainly maize meal porridge in South Africa which is followed by almost 8% of households um, talking about spices, condiments, hot beverages, which often tea or coffee, um, followed at the same one of sugar. Very often this maize meal 
porridge is consumed with tea, which is, um, adds on about three spoons of sugar in it. So that's the typical diet. But if we look further, we do still have more than 60% of households referring that they eat meat daily, but it's mainly chicken and meat. It's not um, big portions. And then we look into everything else, like milk, milk products, vegetables, food, eggs, fish, seafood. It becomes, um, it becomes less. <clears throat> Looking into local food structures, so I was very much interested, of course, local food. We had a farming area. What does actually stay in the local system? Main products in the region are grains and cereals, also fruits and vegetables, fruits specifically oranges. A lot of oranges you find in Europe are coming from, the, from this area. Um, also potatoes in terms of roots and tubers, um, beef production, milk production, poultry eggs, and peking nuts. Um, I'm just going to um, give you two examples, but um, we looked at what type of producers do we have, is it a private owned business or do we have cooperatives, and how far from their perspective does the food go. We did this for um, an example of each bigger food group, and um, we can for instance see if we look at potatoes, um, uh, it's a private owned business and these potatoes either go directly local through direct access to, to the producer or local wholesalers, they actually stay in the local and regional um, area. But if we see on the opposite, we've got the peking nuts that are almost exclusively produced in this area to be um, shipped uh, internationally because there is a, yeah, a huge cash gain. Uh, and I think it's going to be the Asian market that's very keen on, on peaking that. Sociocultural aspects was really for me the highlight of, of the project. Um, so our idea was to look into um, what current knowledge, attitudes, practices exist on traditional food among rural Swana women. And we talked to young women, old women, and we made it very interactive. We cooked and um, talked about practices and um, yeah, attitudes towards food. And we really found that was also very closely done with the psychologist. And we really found there's an intergenerational gap between old and young, and the communication due to diverse reasons um, does not go so well. And while we really have a large knowledge of traditional, also indigenous foods in the older generation, the young generation is really not interested, sees traditional food as poor man's food, and you know, it's very much on status, modern food, which represents KFC and, and so forth. So there's really a gap, and then we've got the middle-aged women, so the moms of the youngsters, they still try, they still like traditional food, they still know it from their elders, but they now try to adapt it and make it more um, favorable for the youngsters. So they're really in the middle, changing traditional food, making it more modern, and um, one outcome of this project was that really old women started to realize if we don't talk about this and if we don't keep this heritage, it will be gone very soon. And um, what we did then was, of all the cooking practices, we actually made a cookbook of these specific Twana meals cooked during the event, so traditional Twana meals and files, which is also freely downloadable on, on our website. Um, looking into the policy framework, that was very much led um, by Stephanie. Um, we looked into the main question here was, and further, the main question here was what are the challenges and opportunities of programs promoting local food systems, applying the right to food blends. And we um, had access to three different government programs. One was a poultry farm, it was a women cooperative. Um, one was a vegetable school garden. And then um, the last project was a farmer's market that specifically tried to get local producers to sell their produce in the region. And um, so, uh, we, yeah, as I said, we took the right to food lands and the kind of principles. We're happy to talk a little bit more about it in the discussion if you're interested. But um, the programs, are these programs supportive towards local food systems was our first question. And we really found opportunities as well as challenges. 
and the opportunities show that there is potential in improving farmers' performance, of course, through these programs that we looked at. It may stimulate local economy. Um, it can make quality food affordable for the local population, and there is technical knowledge distribution within these programs. But challenges, on the other hand, where that often there's a focus on production and um, neglect on health and environmental issues, um, and that um, the actors within these specific programs down to the beneficiaries often are not very well linked. Um, are these programs supportive towards um, the right to food in terms of the right holders, meaning the beneficiaries of the programs? We could see that implementation processes are very participatory, of course. Um, the beneficiaries are running the projects. Uh, often the projects aim at involving um, emerging farmers and also often women, and that the participants themselves or the beneficiaries do gain new knowledge on uh, agricultural production up to enterprise skills and so forth. But the challenges were really that um, there was not full transparency. Often beneficiaries did not know what's the food program about, what are the contents, where do information funding streams come from, and are also not aware of um, the right, their right to food. Um, on the last, in, in this um, kind of angle on, on local food systems, we also looked at whether, pro whether these programs are supportive towards the right to food from um, the rights holders kind of perspective. And um, we could see that um, there is participation in the implementation process by the government, government officials that run the project at district level. Um, sorry, I'm still on the wrong slide here. Uh, so the right to food is acknowledged from the constitution down to policy planning. So the words are written in there and is acknowledged. But, and um, the challenges we, we found at the district level is that there is often the lack of capacity in terms of staff and budget. Focus often lies on large projects, again this idea of agricultural large scale production and the communication between different departments in, for example, social development, agriculture, education um, is often not happening. Um, yeah, and um, I think we are slowly hitting the end. We touched on a couple of dimensions. Uh, we had several outputs already from uh, book chapters, the cookbook, articles, conference proceedings. We went to a lot of, and I'm skipping here and there, we went to a lot of different conferences. We also had great media exposure, actually. We, um, especially with the cookbook, we've been in the good news on the public channels in South Africa, kind of steering this traditional food knowledge heritage idea. Um, we had quite a lot of students coming from 2013 to 2016, um, seven master students, two bachelor students, and also interns from Northwest University, Hohenheim University, Eastern University. And because the project was also government funded in between, specifically when we looked into the local food systems, we also um, um, yeah, created a policy brief. And the main reason why I'm here this week is that Stephanie and I are currently working on these two article ideas that we are extracting out of all the data that has been um, collected in the project. One is, um, both are working titles, one is on social assistance or right to food, potentials and constraints of local food systems in South Africa. The other one looks into a uh, supply-demand approach to assessing the retail food environment of rural income households in South Africa. And we would really like to encourage the discussion afterwards um, to hear from you if there are maybe new perspectives that um, we haven't considered here. Also, journal ideas or, or any other input from your side is welcome. And as such, I, I say clearly, Bochas, thank you, and uh, Setswana, thanks for listening. And I hope we'll, we'll still, we still can discuss some, some questions. <laughs>